This is the Mint on ZTN Farmers broadcast to you from Zimbabwe's capital Harare. I'm Iben Mabunda. Uh, coming up on the Mint, a 2023 Transparency International report indicates that despite improvements in fighting corruption among sub Saharan African countries, there's still a long way to go in a fighting graft. The Transparency International Corruption Perceptions Index, CPI, says that more than 85% of countries and sub-Saharan Africa scored under 50, making them countries which are still plagued by corruption. CPI is a global barometer used to measure perceived levels of public sector corruption among 180 territories and Zimbabwe was number 149 out of 180. Today on The Mint, we will unpack all things corruption in Zimbabwe, focusing on its impact on the economy. I want you to know why is Zimbabwe not improving in its fight against corruption? What is the country doing right? What is it doing wrong? Is there a difference between petty and grand corruption and the way they are treated in the courts. Is Zimbabwe's criminal justice system endemically corrupt as alleged? I speak to uh, Transparency International Zimbabwe Executive Director Tafadzwa Chikumbu. The man to brought back. Don't go anywhere. You're watching The Mint as we come to you from Zimbabwe's capital, Harare. I'm Ibn Mabunda. Looking at the most recent stats issued, of course, by uh, Transparency International, as well as what it means for Africa, as well as for Zimbabwe. Now, this year's CPI shows mixed results in Africa with significant improvements in a few countries. However, most African countries experienced stagnation, maintaining the region's consistently poor performance with an with an unaltered regional um, average score of 33 out of 100. The report shows that fighting corruption is among the most important problems that Africans want their governments to address. The region's persistent challenges, experts contend, stem from decades of severe underfunding in public sectors exacerbated by corruption and illicit financial flows siphoning resources away from basic public services. I'm now joined by Tafazwa Chikumbu, Transparency International Zimbabwe Executive Director. Hello, Tafazwa, and welcome to The Mint. Good afternoon, and thank you very much for having me. Fantastic. To break the eyes, what is Transparency International Zimbabwe, and what is, it, is its mandate? Okay, Transparency International Zimbabwe is part of the global movement against corruption, which is Transparency International, and we do operate in over 125 countries. And uh, the reason for our existence in Zimbabwe is to combat corruption and also to prevent corruption from happening. Um, so our work mainly is around um, engaging government, doing lobby and advocacy around anti-corruption policies, and also um, building capacities of anti-corruption institutions for them to effectively um, address corruption. And of course, we do believe that corruption happens when oversight is limited or compromised. So we have a specific role to also ensure that we engage oversight institutions such as Parliament, the Order General's Office, to ensure that they exercise their oversight role. We also do believe that uh, the fight against corruption requires a collective uh, approach and the role of citizens is also very important in the fight against corruption. So we also engage in building a strong citizen agents, an agents that is capable of holding power to account. Right. Now, you released the Corruption Perceptions Index on 180 countries. May you unpack this report narrowing on Zimbabwe's performance according to the aggregates they indicated? Okay. So, on our Corruption Perceptions Index, we noted that the country Zimbabwe uh, scored 23 out of 100, uh, 24 out of 100, which is an improvement from last year's results, which is a 23 out of 100. And one would want to know um, how do we come up with that particular score. Right. We actually rank uh, from 0 to 100. And countries that score closer to 0 are perceived to be highly corrupt, 
while it's those that score closer to 100 are perceived to be less corrupt. So having a score of 23 out of 24 out of 100 uh, and a 23 in 2022 actually shows that our country is not doing quite enough in terms of addressing corruption. So Zimbabwe um, has performed poorly uh, in terms of that particular index. But what we've also noted, um, not just in Africa, but across the globe, is the fact that many countries did drop and the majority of them maintained their score. And the 24 um, is really an insignificant move from 23 last year. So we actually are regarded as one of those countries which has stagnated in terms of the fight against corruption. But of course, that particular one step up is something that we need to celebrate. Um, but of course, I also want to speak in relation to the um, ranking. In as much as the rank is not very important to us as Transparency International, but it is important to note that that one point shift for Zimbabwe actually resulted in it uh, moving from 157 out of 180 countries to 149 out of 180 countries, which is something which ki ki um, concerns Transparency International as a movement because we note that most countries, especially those in sub-Saharan Africa, are actually doing badly in terms of the fight against corruption. Right. Now, have you engaged government on your results and uh, have authorities shown interest to fight corruption and take up, uh, you know, further engagements with the organization? Yeah, actually, when we uh, published the results, the prosecutor general was the uh, guest speaker. Uh, she came forth and she emphasized that um, there are actually two uh, constitutionally mandated institutions in the fight against corruption which is the Zimbabwean Corruption Commission and also the National Prosecuting Authority is provided for in Chapter 13 of our Constitution. So we had a serious engagement with them and we also noted that when we uh, announced the results, it was actually a week after the National Prosecuting Authority had actually issued a statement in which they were actually strongly uh, condemning corruption, especially corruption in the justice sector and where the Prosecutor General himself was actually uh, putting across a commitment in terms of what they are going to do to combat corruption in that particular institution. We also, as Transparency International, have consulted and engaged the National Prosecuting Authority to the extent that we came up with a knockout corruption campaign in the justice system. So it actually shows the kind of traction that we are getting from the National Prosecuting Authority. The same goes to the Zimbabwe Anti-Corruption Commission. Um, they also equally agree that there is rampant and endemic corruption in our country and that the uh, Corruption Perceptions Index is one particular index, uh, which is the only index against corruption, which uh, gives us a wake-up call to ensure that we keep strengthening our tools to engage and also our tools to combat corruption. So indeed, we are engaging with them and we hope that we continue engaging with government because our vision of having a, um, a corrupt-free Zimbabwe resonates with the vision of the country where we have a zero tolerance to corruption. So we do believe that our visions do uh, synchronize, they move together, and we do hope that we continue engaging. Uh, and as Transparency International Zimbabwe as well, we are also part of the working group on the data areas clearance strategy for Zimbabwe. And on that particular strategy, they have a particular pillar on corruption. And we are more often consulted in as far as the fight against corruption is concerned. Right. Um, in your role as a consultant, you play uh, different uh, duties and uh, you also come up with particular recommendations. Here you're just speaking about the debt. But let's get back to the aspect of corruption. What yeah. kind of recommendations would you give um, to say this is how Zimbabwe can navigate itself out of the corruption status that it is in at the moment? Um, you know, the aspects of corruption are quite broad um, and that we do have a fair legal frameworks to combat corruption. Like I've mentioned, Chapter 13 of our Constitution speaks about the institutions that are mandated to combat corruption. 
But we also believe that there's a lot that needs to be done in terms of implementation of the policies that we currently have. So we need to ensure that we implement what we have in terms of our policies. But over and above that, we have also noted that we do not have a whistleblower protection legislation, despite the uh, efforts that have been made to date to come up with principles paving way for the legal frameworks to be developed, we still feel that if we do have a whistleblower protection legislation, uh, people will be willing to either report corruption and also that the witnesses and whistleblowers will actually feel safe when they report corruption. Because most often we are dealing with cases where people come forward to Transparency International Zimbabwe, the Zimbabwe Anti-Corruption Commission, and actually report that um, they reported corruption in their institutions and actually um, corruption is actually fighting back where people are actually uh, being intimidated and getting also fired. sometimes getting fired from their workplaces. Right. So we feel that that particular piece of legislation is important. We also feel that the government needs to revisit in terms of nepotistic appointments. I'm not going to speak specifically to any incident but that's one particular indicator on the Corruption Perceptions Index, that when we appoint, especially political appointees, they need not to be appointed on nepotistic uh, basis. We also need to reduce our, um, uh, our bureaucratic processes. And one of the key issues is around e-governance to ensure that we limit and reduce human interface which is actually a key driver um, for corruption. And one key issue which the public normally talks about is the issue of effective prosecution of corruption cases. Effective prosecution of corruption cases, something that the Prosecutor General also emphasized that they're actually now coming up with specific measures to ensure that they sharpen up um, their work and ensure that most of the high-profile um, high corruption cases are now being dealt with within the High Court. So these are some of the issues that we feel uh, the country needs to do in ensuring that we combat corruption. But of course, fighting corruption also involves uh, preventing it from happening. Something that has to be done in terms of um, a cultural shift, because in as far as we are concerned, corruption has been normalized in our country, so we need a cultural shift. And also we need to ensure that we have strong oversight institutions and also the government institutions are accountable and transparent and also ensures that citizens participate in governance processes. But I'll take you up on the global uh, CPI uh, yes. report. Mm -hmm. um, what is it that some of our regional counterparts are doing that we are not doing specifically? And how can we tap into some of what they've been able to do successfully? Um, actually, for me, um, the major issue that we still lack in terms of combating corruption is having um, an effective sanctioning system for corruption cases uh, or corruption crimes. So as long as um, people who are corrupt are given um, lenient uh, sentences, actually it promotes corruption. So we need to ensure that we uh, strengthen our sanctioning system and ensure that what obtains in law, especially around public finance management, is actually uh, being put to practice. If you look at our public finance management framework in our country, uh, it has a sanctioning system. If someone violates specific uh, financial management procedures, they are supposed to be punished this way and uh, the specific terms that they are given. But in most cases, the Auditor General comes up with its report um, and we still see the people are not sanctioned in terms of their crimes. Right. Um, just to sort of draw from uh, some illustrations from, from the region, um, yeah. we know that in Nigeria, mm -hmm. um, some recovery was made from some funds that were looted, looted from the former and late president, Sani Abache, mm -hmm. um, in Kenya. Uh, they also made some recoveries from the former president, uh, Moy, um, and we're talking of hundreds of millions of, mm -hmm. of, of, of US dollars. Yeah. Are you satisfied with the efforts of trying to recover some of the funds that may have been looted by identified corrupt 
elements or individuals um, within the system, be it current or over you know, the past decades or so? Yeah, actually one of the key uh, elements which I would, would have missed is the issue of asset recovery. And we know that you know once you lose results, uh, you lose resources, even if you prosecute people, uh, we still need to recover the money, we still need to recover the assets. And uh, in our conversation with the National Prosecuting Authority, they indicated that they are making a headway in terms of uh, identifying ill-gotten wealth. And some have been identified in South Africa, some have been identified locally, and efforts are underway to ensure that they recover. They've also recovered some of those assets domestically, but I think what still remains is to ensure that we also recover the assets that are stashed either within the region or stashed in secret jurisdictions and um, tax havens. But I think what I've also noted is that uh, much effort has been made in terms of recovering assets domestically, and still a lot needs to be done in terms of strengthening our mutual legal assistance procedures with other countries so that, um, you know, corruption is regarded as a transnational or transboundary uh, crime which requires uh, mutual legal assistance from other states. Right, of course, collaboration will be important in this particular endeavor. Now, time for us to take a break. When we come back, we continue with the conversation with Transparency International Zimbabwe on how to address corruption issues in Zimbabwe. The meant to be right back. Don't go anywhere. They call me Racer X, or in this case, Racer J. Right. Put your seatbelt on. You're watching The Mentors, broadcast to you from Zimbabwe's capital, Harare. I'm Ibn Mabunda. We are discussing the most recent report uh, released by Transparency International, and we have Transparency International Zimbabwe in conversation today to find out how we can change and transform the narrative of Zimbabwe and as far as corruption is actually concerned. Now, um, research indicates that financial hardships and weakening buying power may lead to some people engaging in crime and corruption. In some cases, people engage in corruption unaware because they may not be aware of the law. In your view, are citizens fully aware of the law or do we still need some degree of awareness? Um, I do agree with the assertion that um, sometimes when people are not fully remunerated, uh, sometimes they do engage in corruption. Um, and that is something which we normally get as an excuse from some public officials. So the issue of economic hardships, especially in as far as um, those that are employed in the public service, can actually um, result in corruption happening. But at the same time, um, I also believe that corruption, uh, when it becomes a culture, uh, rationalization do happen where people start saying, you know, everyone is doing it. And there is always an, a, a phrase which is used in Zimbabwe, um, which means that, uh, you know, you benefit from your workplace. Okay. So whenever people are employed, especially in the public service, they quickly look for opportunities in their organizations so that they can look at either their loopholes, those opportunities, to um, benefit from public resources for own private gain. 
So that can actually happen. But we also think that uh, the issue of corruption in Zimbabwe should also be looked at holistically um, to ensure that we build a new culture um, of integrity. We build a new culture where people are transparent, where people are accountable. Uh, we need to be accountable. When we um, are entrusted with power, when we are entrusted with power, we are subject to abuse power. And as a result, where there are accountable uh, mechanisms, transparent mechanisms, we need to um, stick to those to ensure that um, whether there are economic hardships or no economic hardships, the principles, ethos, values, and the integrity system that we have adopted as a country can actually guide us. Right. Um, I've got to ask, what is your assessment of the extent of the corruption um, in this country, if we were to put it in figures, and what does this mean? Um, actually, we don't have a specific quantified amount that we lose out to corruption, but uh, because corruption is a component of illicit financial flows, and also is a facilitator of illicit financial flows, the Reserve Bank has estimated that this country loses um, a whole two billion annually as a result of illicit financial flows. So I do believe that most of the resources that we lose are actually facilitated by corrupt tendencies, facilitated by corrupt practices. So we do believe that um, the amount that we lose uh, is actually more than the two billion out of corruption. So two billion is actually an underestimation. Uh, we, as we currently work with that particular figure because that's what is official from the Reserve Bank of Zimbabwe. Right. In October last year, the Zimbabwe Anti-Corruption Commission had achieved a 77% conviction rate, which was a 5% improvement from the 2022 figure of 72%. In your view, has the ZACC, Zimbabwe Anti-Corruption Commission, managed to take, to tackle and take on uh, corruption head-on? Um, actually, the fight against corruption follows an anti-corruption chain which involves investigators, um, prosecutors, uh, you know, so, uh, and also involves the police and ZAC as investigators. So I do believe that uh, uh, there's a lot that is happening in terms of arrests. There's a lot that is happening uh, in terms of uh, investigation of those corruption cases. But as Transparency International Zimbabwe, when we did our analysis and assessment of the situation, we noted that um, most arrests were done, but then it takes a lot of time for such particular cases to be either investigated or actually to be prosecuted in the courts. So we do believe that uh, there is still room for improvement for the Zimbabwe Corruption Commission. They still have a lot to do to ensure that, um, yes, they do arrest, uh, they are properly investigated, so that they can actually um, guarantee convictions when they are submitted before the National Prosecuting Authority. And according to those figures, I can't dispute the figures, but uh, the Court of Public Opinion, which we normally engage in when we meet the public, they still feel that less is being done to combat this cage. Right. Um, in the media, time to time, we get reports of uh, what appear to be, in quotes, catch and release uh, systems uh, whereby the Zimbabwe Anti-Corruption Commission may identify corruption cases, but some individuals uh, have not been prosecuted or arrested. What, what could be uh, behind this and what's your assessment of that particular situation there? Yes, the issue of catch and release remains um, an issue which the public uh, always raise and are concerned about. And as Transparency International Zimbabwe, we are equally concerned. And we take the Court of Public Opinion seriously in those matters. What we have noted is that sometimes um, arrests are made, then people are entitled to bail when they go to court. So they go to court, they are granted bail, they go out. Then the matters uh, take longer to be investigated. And then people see um, the the perpetrators scot-free and sometimes the courts are still dealing with cases um, 
which has been with the courts for more than five years, some for more than 10 years. So those are the same concerns that we do have to ensure that we expedite uh, that process from investigation, arrests, to prosecution. Something that I've said the Prosecutor General has um, actually committed to, and we do hope that um, they will actually abide by that commitment. And as Transparency International Zimbabwe, we remain a watchdog. We monitor and we review the work that government is doing. And by the end of the year, we will actually sit down with the PG and ensure that we see how far they've gone in terms of ensuring that they expedite prosecution of corruption cases. Now, Zimbabwe is in the process of coming up with whistleblower and witness protection legislation, mm -hmm. as well as an, an amendment to the Anti-Corruption Commission Act to perhaps include sector-specific corruption offenses. Question is, how far has this gone? How far have you gone? And uh, what is your assessment of uh, the progress that's been made thus far? Um, I'll start with the whistleblower protection legislation. Right. Um, uh, this is in line with the United Nations Convention Against Corruption. Um, all state parties to that convention are required to come up with whistleblower protection uh, legislation to protect um, the reporting persons. So if you report corruption, you need to be uh, protected, just like I said earlier on, that when you are not protected, you are unwilling to report corruption, and sometimes you put your lives in danger. So that particular piece of legislation, we did a campaign uh, with the Zimbabwean Corruption Commission, uh, we raised awareness uh, to the point where the cabinet adopted the principles for the whistleblower protection and witness protection separately. Um, but of course, since uh, 2021, uh, the same pieces of legislation are still, uh, have not yet been um, adopted. So we feel that we are not doing enough in ensuring that we move with the speed that we need to combat corruption. But in our recent engagements with the Minister of Justice, they do, did indicate that this is a priority for this particular parliament and specifically for this year. So we look forward to that being prioritized and those two pieces of legislation coming out. Then with regard to the Zimbabwe and Corruption Commission Act review, uh, we've also engaged, uh, identified some of the gaps within the legal framework, some of which it doesn't provide for whistleblower protection and other things that are pertinent to the fight against corruption. Uh, so there is a general consensus that that particular piece of legislation needs to be addressed. As I've indicated earlier on that the anti-corruption agenda is also part of the a specific pillar under the data areas uh, clearance strategy. And the Minister of Justice has put that um, a legal reform as part of their agenda item uh, of for, course. For, for that. So we do hope that they can actually move with speed and ensure that it can run. Right. We are running out of time. In just mm -hmm. one minute, um, do you think that enough allocations were made by Treasury uh, to anti-corruption agencies, including Zimbabwe Anti-Corruption Commission, National Prosecuting Authority, and the Zimbabwe Republic Police, other agencies that are uh, play an active role in dealing with that in less than one minute? Yeah, uh, our assessment is that those anti-corruption uh, anti -corruption agencies are not being properly uh, funded. Uh, the allocations are way below our expectations. And we do feel that if the government is quite sincere in the fight against corruption, they should actually commit more resources towards the national anti-corruption strategy implementation, which also ensures that all these institutions are properly funded and functional. Transparency International Executive Director Tafazwa Chukumbu, sir, thank you for joining us on no The Mint. Now, that's a wrap on today's episode of The Mint. Do follow us on our social media handles as in Papers TV Network as well as at ZTN Prime. I'm Ibn Mabunda, the money man. Let them do what they do. When we do what we do, we mean business. Thank you for watching and have a good day. <laughs>